Now let's look at a couple of tools to deal with files as such, not looking at the content of the file, but uh, finding the files, packaging them up, um, changing the access control permissions and so on. First tool here is on, on the latter. If you are sharing a hard disk with other users, if because it's a, it's a file server in some organization or uh, a server that you uh, remotely log into, uh, then for each of your files, you can specify these nine bits here that the ls-l command indicates. And this is uh, a linearly laid out three by three matrix where you have a read, a write, and an execute bit, read, write, execute for three groups of users, namely for the user or the owner of the file, who's indicated here, then for a group of users to which this file has been assigned. This here is the group to which this has been assigned. And here the last three of these read, write, execute bits give the permissions for anyone else who's not a user or a uh, member of this group. So for example, here we want to remove for the group and for all others the read, write and execute writes. And then these R bits here have disappeared. There's a couple of more bits that can be set with this command. There's something called a set user ID and set group ID bit. And those will be discussed in either operating system uh, classes or in the security course. So I won't go in more detail in here. Uh, I only want to mention that for a directory, the execution write, the X bit here, has a, a different meaning. The execution bit means you can go through that directory, whereas the R bit means you can uh, check uh, what contents, you can look at the table of contents of this uh, directory. So you can give people X but not R access to a directory and then they can access files in there for which they know the name, but they can't actually find out what the names of the files are. So this is a little bit of a trick to get kind of a password-like protection for files if the file name is treated a bit like a password. If you do have read access to and both read and uh, traversal access uh, to uh, a tree of subdirectories, then you can use the find command to recursively uh, visit each of these directories and each of the files in these directories and do something, execute some operations on them. And uh, a simple example is find start in the current directory, which we can in indicate with a dot and just print the relative path name of that directory starting from the dot here. Um, the, in addition to commands like print or exec, where you hand over the file name to another shell command, you can also build entire Boolean expressions. So here we start the search in tilde, that's expanded into the home directory by the shell. Uh, and then we test whether any name encountered in this recursive search uh, matches the name core. So we look for all core files. These are uh, left behind by the kernel if there is an um, exception and, and a process had to be aborted. Um, we also check, for example, whether the file is older than 10 days. And then here we call the rm command to remove something. rm minus i asks for an interactive uh, confirmation. And the curly braces here are a placeholder that the find command will actually uh, replace uh, with the actual file name. And the semicolon here uh, indicates for the exec option that this is the end of the shell command. So afterwards here we could provide further commands. So you can see here already it's quite important to understand a little bit which of these characters is being interpreted as a meta character by the shell or by the find command. Um, the semicolon is normally a shell meta character as we've seen so you have to prefix it with a backslash such that the find command even can receive the semicolon as the last of its um, command line arguments and likewise 
the find command will never see the tilde character because the tilde expansion will replace that. On that note, revising a little bit uh, how uh, meta characters get expanded here, a curious little uh, trick that I sometimes use is um, you can destroy a lot of work if you accidentally type rm star in a folder. So in directories uh, where you almost certainly never want to delete everything like your home directory or other important places, I use the touch command to create an empty file minus i. And then if I ever accidentally typed rm star in that folder, what will happen is that this file name here will be, the, the star will be replaced with a list of all file names that match, namely all files, and that will include the minus i. The rm does not know whether the minus i was typed by me as a file or has been uh, passed onto it as the result of um, path expansion. And as a result, in those uh, folders rm minus i will actually call the uh, cause the rm command to switch into interactive mode and then will interactively ask me do you really want to delete this file to really want to delete the next file and so on so it's, it's a somewhat ugly hack um, but it saved me at least once and it's a neat little demonstration to help you a little bit understanding uh, which of these characters get interpreted by either the shell or by the uh, tool that's being called by the shell. Another tool that recursively visits all files in a file tree is uh, tar, the tape archiver. And as the very ancient name suggests, this was used in order to write, to serialize an entire a directory tree and write it out to a magnetic tape. Magnetic tapes have long fallen out of fashion, but the tar tool also has a option F that instead of a magnetic tape uh, talks to a, produces a file or reads from a file. And these files that contain the same uh, serialized byte stream of a Unix directory tree that were originally written to backup tapes uh, are today called tar files and are written with the .tar extension. So if I have a folder called files and I want to just put everything in there into a single file, I call tar and I use the command C for create a new tar archive. V just puts it in verbose mode so you see a bit better what's going on. And F is the option for not trying to actually find a tape drive as a peripheral device, but writing everything into the file name that follows the F option, namely here, archive.tar. If you receive a tar file, you can use the T command to look at the table of contents. If it's a very large file, you will find that this can be a somewhat slow option because uh, the tar command doesn't have a table of contents at the beginning of the file that could be read quickly. The file name follow is immediately uh, adjacent to the content of the file. So the uh, T command actually has to read the entire tar file, um, which has the advantage that it also forms a kind of integrity check whether uh, the tar file is syntactically correct. And then if you extract a tar file with the x command, it will write out the relative path names that you saw with the t command. So you may want to check, for example, whether all the first with the t command, whether all the files are written into a common subdirectory. That's kind of the polite way in case you um, accidentally unpack a tar file. There's only the subdirectory that you have to delete. Whereas if everything has been uh, just saved as a, as a flat namespace and you accidentally unpack this in your home directory, then you may have all your own files mixed with possibly hundreds of files that came out of the tar file. So you want to extract in a new subdirectory unless you first convinced yourself that everything will already go into a new subdirectory. Um, by default, the X command will extract everything, but you can specify a list of file of folders to selectively only 
extract a couple of folders. Um, <clears throat> the tar tool actually predates the invention of encryption uh, of compression algorithms, and there have been many generations of uh, compression algorithms, and therefore it was with hindsight quite fortunate that in the Unix world the tool that you use to serialize a um, directory tree into a byte sequence, namely tar or CPIO is, is another one that's more rarely used, um, and the compression of this uh, by uh, using Huffman algorithms, arithmetic coding uh, algorithms for pointing backwards to strings that have already occurred in the uh, encoded file uh, previously, that these are done by separate files. And one of the most popular ones is the gzip tool. You just write gzip and then a file name and it will compress the file and the compressed version of the file will also be renamed to have the .gz suffix in order to indicate that this was compressed with the gzip file. But this is just a single file. So there is gzip doesn't know anything about directory structures. It deals with one file at a time. And then there's a gunzip where you provide a file.gz and then it will uh, remove the file.gz and will replace it with just the file with the gz suffix removed and everything uncompressed. There are older versions of the same idea, tools called compress and uncompress. They fell a bit out of fashion after it emerged that the, the employer of the inventor of this um, tool um, discovered that they had a patent and for nearly 20 years they tried to make some money out of this. They didn't really, but this basically stimulated a lot of research. People thought, ah, we, maybe we can come up with better algorithms that also don't have a patent. Um, so the uh, patent system here did serve its function that it created innovation by people trying to avoid the patent. Um, there's also the uh, bzip and bunzip tool, uh, which provides somewhat slower but uh, better compression than the gzip tile, uh, the, the gzip file format. I mentioned bzip2 in particular because uh, this was actually developed, uh, not the tool, but the algorithm behind it was developed here at the computer laboratory by uh, David Wheeler and uh, Mike Burrows, his PhD student. Um, and uh, there's also a uh, streaming version of this, uh, the Zcat tool. If you provide it with any of these uh, files, then it will just write the output to standard output. So if you receive, for example, some archive with .tar .gz, that means you first have to unzip it and you can use Zcat to unzip it into a standard output and then you follow that with the tar command and you just provide the hyphen, which by convention is the special file name that refers to standard input for many tools. And this will immediately extract everything that has been decompressed here without actually wasting any disk space by first saving into a file the, um, the uncompressed archive. Um, of course, this is a regularly occurring pattern. So uh, some newer versions of tar, the GNU version, for example, there's an option uh, Z to do the decompression already in the tar tool. 